अखंडम सच्चिदानंदम अवांगमनसगोचर आत्मानम अखिलाधारम आश्रय भीष्ट सिद्ध I take refuge in the self the indivisible the existence consciousness bliss absolute beyond the reach of words and thought and the substratum of all for the attainment of my cherished desire so in the vedanta sara we had reached text number 90 is that right is that about right text number 90 i think we had done i remember doing text number 89 last time so what's happened till now what are the pieces in the game we know the basic understanding is that there is one absolute reality which is brahman but then the question remains that what about all this where did all this come from what is all this so the vedanta sar starts with um that vastu satchidananda madvayam brahma brahman is the only reality which is non dual even the word non dual means that there is no second reality apart from brahman so brahman is the only reality non dual and what is this brahman existence consciousness bliss and then everything else that we see we don't see it as brahman then what is this this is in reality brahman but in appearance agyanaadi sakala jada samuha avastu um from ignorance downwards from maya downwards everything is um, an appearance and jada samuha jada jada means object an object of knowledge a material object so these are all material objects uh, they are all appearances and then we saw um an investigation into what maya is what is it that causes brahman to appear in this way uh, there was a discussion about maya the properties of maya uh, among the properties of maya is that it um it can be uh divided into infinitesimally small parts or it can be taken as one as a whole so when it is taken one as a whole brahman and maya brahman limited by this maya which is not ultimately real brahman limited by this um uh, this relative maya uh, is called god or ishwara and brahman limited by a part but by each part of maya becomes the individual sentient beings which we in ultimately which will be like us so the other thing interesting about it was the maya has two powers one is veiling and one is projecting so maya has the capacity of uh, veiling brahman that it it that everything is brahman is not clear to us at all that we are brahman it's not clear to us at all we think we are these limited bodies and minds um the projecting power of maya then what does it do that same brahman the same ultimate reality it projects as this relative reality that absolute reality alone is projected as the relative reality that brahman alone is projected as this universe how does it do that in three stages the first stage is causal second stage is subtle and third stage is gross gross in the sense of physical not in the sense of you know awful or something the physical so causal causal is maya maya itself is causal uh, so the, the causal state is maya itself and consciousness in association with maya at that stage is is god literally god is the cause of this universe and that notice that in a different language all the theistic religions actually say that god is the um cause of this universe god is, god is the creator and preserver and destroyer at the source of this universe is god so that is the causal level of creation um it's like a seed and then comes this subtle level how does the subtle level come maya projects this brahman itself as the five subtle elements space earth uh, sorry space then air and fire and water and earth and that earth is not for example um you know this thing no it's not a physical gross thing it's a subtle element and those subtle elements in sanskrit known as sukshma or tanmatra uh, sukshma bhuta or tanmatra these subtle elements they combine together and they produce subtle bodies what's a subtle body um what's a causal body ignorance itself maya itself is the causal body what's a subtle body 
And the subtle body um, is composed of 17 parts and we saw the 17 parts and how they come from the subtle elements. You know, the five sense organs, the five motor organs, the, the five pranas and the inner, so-called inner instrument, mind, intellect, that makes 17. But if you further count memory and ego, that makes 19. Whatever, the whole set is called the subtle body. This is what undergoes, um, which, this is what goes from birth to birth. So that same consciousness, which was there, now covered with or limited by Maya, is now covered with or limited by all these subtle bodies and will be called Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. And the same um, Brahman, limited by individual causal bodies and individual subtle bodies. Remember, when you're talking about a subtle body, you're already assuming the causal body is still there. Causal body then further covered over by a subtle body is us sentient beings. Um, so it's called, it says, Vyavaharika Jiva. For the first time, a transactional, active sentient being comes, thinking, feeling, knowing, doing, all this becomes possible when the subtle body is there. That's very recognizable as us, that thinking being embodied. We still don't have a physical body, but the thinking being which we identify ourselves as this person, this is that subtle body. Consciousness flowing through the causal body and the subtle body is the person you think yourself to be, is I, what I think myself to be. And we were told that it has the powers of jnana, knowing. So Brahman as pure consciousness does not know directly. It generates a causal body and a subtle body, then it can know something, know in the sense of our sense of knowing, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, understanding, remembering. It has the power of desiring, icha, and it's the power of doing, kriya, jnana, icha, kriya, the power of knowing, desiring, and doing. These come with the, with the subtle body. You think of it as a set of apps. Yeah, it's the same phone, or the same computer. The set of apps enables you to do many more things with that. So the same Brahman now can do so all these things. And the question will come, oh, so Brahman does depend on a subtle body or a causal body. And Brahman by itself does, seems to be pretty useless. It's like saying that gold does depend on a necklace to be worn you know, and used in these ways and to be called a necklace. Yes and no. Because the necklace itself is nothing but the gold. This universe and the body and the subtle body, causal body, whatever you call it, whatever fancy name you give it, is nothing but Brahman, is nothing but God. One reality alone is there. So these things, they are, you can call them the glory of God. You can call them the glory of Brahman. They, it's not that Brahman has become dependent on this, like depending on a crutch and walking on that, you know, not like that. This idea of dependence, this idea of duality comes from a Sankhya. Purusha does depend on Prakriti. In Sankhya philosophy, there are two realities, consciousness and matter. And consciousness does depend on matter for every kind of material experience and activity. Because matter is different from consciousness in Sankhya philosophy. But in Advaita, matter is merged back. Prakriti, Maya are merged back into Brahman. So it is Brahman's glory, or Brahman's power, whatever you call it. All right. This is what we have got so far. Now let's go ahead. Before closing this topic of subtle bodies, uh, we are now ready to slowly move into the gross universe, the physical universe. This actually the stuff which we are seeing around us. Uh, how does that come? So the movement is from uh, absolute reality, Brahman, to the uh, causal, to the subtle. And now uh, we are moving towards the gross or the physical our actual, these bodies will also come. But before that, uh, the author wants to make a point that the oneness which we, which we began, Brahman is one reality. That was maintained when Maya came. You can think of Maya, he's, remember they said you can think of Maya as a forest, as one forest or a collection of trees. It's the same thing. And now that we, are, we have a very complex set of subtle bodies, so many subtle bodies, the oneness is still maintained. Uh, he'll just make a point that it is still one reality. Uh, text number 90. So I'll just quickly read through this, take some questions, then move on to the next important thing, which is the, the dirty work of producing the physical universe. A lot of hard labor ahead of us. 
Atrapi, I'm reading text number 90. Atrapi, Akhila Sukshma Shariram, Eka Buddhi Vishayataya, Vanavat, Jalashaya Vadva, Samashti, Aneka Buddhi Vishayataya, Vrikshavat, Jalavadva, Vyashti Rapi Bhavati. Here also, the sum total of all the subtle bodies when looked upon as one, like a forest or a reservoir, is called Samashti or aggregate. And when viewed as many, like the trees or quantities of water, is called Vyashti or individual. Same thing, basically. You just take all the subtle bodies together and you can think of it as one subtle body. That will be the subtle body of God. It will be the cosmic mind. Or you can take them individually, like we are doing right now. All of us, each of us, when you look at, I mean, it's, it's not saying something very esoteric. When you look at all these people on the screen, you know in each of those bodies dwells a mind. And we feel these are separate minds, individual minds, you know, individual subtle bodies, minds, intellects, memories, egos, um, the whole set of pranas and sense organs. So they each has a separate subtle body. You can take, think of them as separate, as many, many subtle bodies, or as all of those billions as one subtle body. Um, as you can think of a forest as one forest or many, many trees. You can think of the reservoir as one mass of water or billions of drops of water. So, 91. So what the point he's going to make is in 91. Etat samashti upahitam chaitanyam sutratma hiranyagarbha pranas chaityuchyate sarvatra suyatvat jnana kriya shakti mad upahitatvat cha Consciousness associated with this quality is called sutratma, hiranyagarbha and prana etc. Because um, it is imminent everywhere and because it identifies itself with the five great uncompounded elements endowed with powers of knowledge, will and activity. Basically what is he saying here? He's talking about the existence of a cosmic mind. What's a cosmic mind? All our minds put together. By mind I just don't mean one mind. I mean, uh, I'm just mind, I mean intellects, memories, all the data we have stored, all our processing capacity, all our creativity, all our personalities, all our egos, all put together into one extraordinary, you know, internet, uh, internet of the mind, a cosmic mind. So there you can take it all as one mind, a cosmic mind. And behind that is consciousness. Consciousness, cosmic causal body, cosmic mind. What is this consciousness plus cosmic causal body called? Ishwara or God. What is this consciousness plus cosmic causal body and cosmic mind called? Hiranyagarbha. He is giving three names here. Hiranyagarbha, prana. Um, so this prana is not the prana. Don't mix it up with it. The word prana is used in many ways. It's not the prana which is the vital force. Uh, not the prana which is the breathing in, breathing out. Here prana means the cosmic mind. Why would you call, use the same word? Isn't it confusing? Why would you use the same word for something extraordinary like the cosmic mind? Because um, the subtle body, the most obvious part of the subtle body right now is this process of breathing, which we have, which is a link between the subtle body and the physical universe. Uh, so you take that as indicating the entire subtle body. So prana here, is taken as in indicating the entire world of energy, um, vitality. Beyond that, the entire world of um, mind, mind, intellect, memory, ego. See, when I'm using the word mind, I'm using it in the sense of the entire uh, inner instrument, mind, intellect, ego, memory, all together. It is also known as uh, Sutratma. The how do you put, put it? Sutra Atma is like literally means like a sutra means a thread, like a thread going through a garland. When you have a garland with many flowers or you have a garland with many gems, it's all linked together by a thread. So the cosmic mind is what runs through all of us as a thread, as all all billions and billions of living beings. It it runs through all of us as a thread. It it's the mind which unites the whole thing. Um. So what did we read? Etat samashti. This totality, which totality? Totality of all subtle bodies. Etat samashti upahitam chaitanyam. Consciousness associated with all this totality of um, subtle bodies 
is given few names sutratma like a thread like the thread soul let us call it which runs through all beings hiranyagarbha literally the golden egg uh, it's because that's where i'll tell you why it is the golden egg it's it's actually the originator of the universe and so i thought god was the originator of the universe yes but god is a kind of non active partner sleeping partner the actual work is subcontracted to uh, hiranyagarbha in uh, hindu mythology he is called brahma so brahma is the creator of the world actually and this is brahma not brahman brahman is the absolute reality this is brahma with an a the creator of the world this is brahma the one who comes up in the navel of vishnu sitting on a lotus uh, so the brahma vishnu maheshwara of that of the trio of the triad of gods the creator preserver and destroyer so brahma that brahma another name is prana what does it what does it do sarvatra anusuya anusuyatva because it is pervading all bodies it is running through all bodies like a thread like a thread runs through all flowers of a garland and what powers does it have gyana ichcha kriya shakti so it has the powers of knowledge and it has the power of willing or desiring and the power of doing just like our minds we have the powers of knowing things we see hear smell taste touch we understand we remember and we have the power of desire i want i will do this and we actually have the power of executing we put the mind is what puts the physical body into action so three powers gyana ichcha shakti these become manifest at this level again question might come so brahman in itself is powerless useless and powerless brahman <laughs> two answers one is all these powers ultimately they belong to brahman after all all the beauty of a necklace or a bracelet it is the beauty of the gold itself without the gold none of that would be possible you have worked upon the gold to bring out that beauty similarly all these powers are inherent in brahman itself if you call them uh, they depend on brahman for their very existence they depend on brahman for their manifestation so that's one answer and the deeper answer is power is actually a sign of weakness when we do not have power we are called weak and those who have power they are powerful but powerful and weak with regard to the ability to do certain things to fulfill certain desires the very fact that we have to do certain things that we have desires to be fulfilled it shows limitation it shows limitation i to cross the um, hudson river i need the george washington bri- bridge and uh, um, a bird can fly across so bird is more powerful than me yes but in one sense it's also limited it needs to fly across if it were everywhere for example if it's the sky does the sky need to go anywhere does the sky need the power to drive across a bridge or fly over something no it's everywhere so something like absolute like brahman would not have any desires would not have things to be accomplished that is the sign of supreme power this is absolutely no need for power there and so i don't know if that makes sense to you that's one way of looking at it and then notice also again and again the words you being used one word is being repeated here upahitam upahita upahita means remember the term i used upadhi like the uh, red flower being present near a crystal so crystal is there a clear um, so like this for example so and now this is clear no color the moment i bring a yellow cloth behind it now it looks yellow it has not become yellow at any time but the very presence of the yellow cloth makes it look yellow this yellow cloth is called the upadhi of this thing it lends its properties to this as if not that anything enters into it, it just looks like that this is called upahita so all of this according to advaita vedanta nothing really has happened to brahman nothing really has happened in reality uh, it is because of this magic generated by maya that brahman seems to have all this causal body subtle bodies powers of knowing hearing doing and desiring all of this all right now little more before i stop 
text number 92. Asyesha samashtihi sthula prapancha pekshaya sukshmatvat sukshma shariram vijyanamayadi koshatrayam jagrad vasanamayatvat swapna atayeva sthula prapancha layasthanam iti chauchyate. All right. Now, this totality of all subtle bodies, um, this cosmic mind, this totality of subtle bodies, um, is, uh, it's made of the, what is it made of? Vijnanamaya kosha, the sheath of the intellect, manomaya kosha, sheath of the mind, and pranamaya kosha. What about anandamaya kosha? That's causal, at the causal level, karana sharira. At the subtle level, sukshma sharira are the three, vijnanamaya, intellect sheath, manomaya, mind sheath, pranamaya, the vital sheath. So this totality, this all subtle bodies took, um, taken together. Why is it called subtle? What's subtle about it? Sthula prapancha pekshaya sukshmatvat. Sukshma shariram. Because it is subtler than the gross universe which is to come next. We're going to produce it now. You see, where does this, cause, where does this question arise? All we are used, we have got so far. Look at the things we have got so far in our... Um, play set. We have got uh, the absolute reality Brahman, which is extraordinarily subtle. And uh, we have got Maya, which is really, really subtle. And now we have got these subtle elements and subtle bodies. Why are you calling these subtle? What are these subtle with regard to? These are actually gross, quite gross compared to Brahman and Maya. Do you see where the question is coming? Uh, why is the subtle body called subtle? Subtle with regard to what? So he's explaining with subtle with regard to something that's going to come next, which is the physical body. Not subtle with regard to what has gone on previously, which is Maya itself and Brahman. Those are even more subtle than this. So it doesn't deserve, subtle body doesn't deserve to be called subtle with regard to consciousness itself, Brahman itself or Maya itself. No. But it is subtle compared to the physical, this body which is going to come next. Um, Vijnanamayadi Koshatrayam, which is composed of the three koshas, Vijnanamaya, Manomaya, and Anandamaya. Jagrat Vasana Mayatvat Swapna. It is also another name for this is dream. It is equivalent to a dream in the sense that it is pervaded by the experiences of the waking state. And Sthula Prapancha Layasthanamiti Chauchyate. It is the place where the physical, the gross universe is dissolved. Dissolved is merged back. Um, daily in our dreams and ultimately at the time of cosmic dissolution when um, Ishwara, God, dissolves the universe. The physical universe will, will be uh, withdrawn back into the mind of God. And the mind of God will be withdrawn back into the causal body of God. And that's how the universe will remain for untold eons until God again projects this. This is the so-called cyclic theory of creation, preservation, and destruction of the universe. Many universes uh, projected over infinite time. And the um, whole game goes on. Many jivas, many infinite sentient beings like us playing this game and becoming liberated and so on. And that's it's really stupendous. I, I remember reading Carl Sagan. He had this wonderful book, Cosmos, and there was a serial. It was one of the few Western serials we had on TV in India when we were kids. We used to watch Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And in his book, in Cosmos, he talks about scales of time. And he says that uh, compared to primitive civilizations, now in our modern scientific age, the scales of time which we are used to, billions of years, uh, the primitive ideas of creation which started a few thousand years ago, those are childish compared to what we're talking about now, billions and billions of years. And then he ends, there's only one scale of time, which is even more stupendous than our modern scientific conception. And then he says, it's the ancient Hindu conception of the cyclic universe uh, over, uh, uh, he says, an infinity of eons of time. Um, this universe is coming into being, playing out over billions of years, disappearing, more universes coming into being. So he says that is even more stupendous than our present scientific conception. So he says, Tula Prapancha Layasthanam. The subtle um, universe 
is the place where the physical universe is dissolved. What it just means is our experience of the physical universe disappears when we go fall in, fall asleep and dream. And actually, this physical universe will disappear back into um, the cosmic mind at the end of this present cycle of creation. Um, little more, be a little, be a little patient till we finish this section. Now, this is the cosmic mind. What about us, individual beings? That's coming next. I'll just race through this. 93. Etad vyashti upahitam chaitanyam teijaso bhavati tejo maya antakkarana upahitatvat. Consciousness associated with each individual subtle body is known as taijasa or full of light on account of its being associated with the effulgent inner organ, antakkarana. That's us they're talking about. Pure consciousness, Brahman, um, limited by each individual subtle body. Is this each? Right now we can identify here there are 73 subtle bodies. And of course physical bodies. But 73 subtle bodies. And therefore we say that there are 73 participants. Zoom can count 73 participants. Uh, each of these subtle bodies is different. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, personal narrative, his, so the, this each subtle body, limiting and channelizing Brahman, is what is called individual sentient being. Um, the name given is Taijasa, full of light. It's, it's associated with individual mind, Antakkarana. What does this individual subtle body do? 94. Asya piyam vyashtihi sthula sharira pekshaya sukshmatvad iti heto reva sukshma shariram vijjana mayadi koshatrayam jagradvasana mayatvat sapna sapna ataeva sthula sharira layasthanam iti chochyate the individual limiting adjunct of taijasa too so it's a, such a cumbersome term individual limiting adjunct what he means is our mind and the individual limit or subtle body let's call it subtle body the individual limiting adjunct, adjunct of taijasa too made up of three sheets Vijnanamaya, Manomaya, Pranamaya is called the subtle body. Why is it called? What is it subtle in comparison to? It is because it is finer than the gross body. Which gross body? This one. It is also called the dream state as it consists of the impressions of the waking state. And for that very reason, it is known as the merging place for the gross body. When you fall asleep, we lose contact with our gross body. That's all it means. Then 95. We'll do up to 97 and stop. Eto sutrat mataijaso tadanim manovritti bhi sukshma vishayan ananu sukshma vishayan anubhavataha ravivikta bhuk taijasa ityadi shutehe. The sutratma and taijasa at that time, through subtle functionings of the mind, experience the subtle objects. That means our own thoughts, dreams, memories, ideas. This is what we experience. Witness such shruti passages and quoting from the Mandukya Upanishad. We have done all this in the Mandukya. Taijasa is the enjoyer of subtle objects. 96. Here also, you can talk about it as uh, individual and, and um, gross, you know. Atrapi samashti vyashti vyashtyo ho tadupahita sutratma taijasa yo ho vanavrikshavad tadavachinna akashavacha jalashaya jalagata um, jalavat tadgata patibimba akashavacha abhedaha here also, the aggregate and individual subtle bodies are identical, like a forest and its trees, or like a lake and its waters. And the sutrat mantajasa, which have those bodies as the limiting adjuncts, are also identical, like the spaces enclosed by a forest and its trees, or like the skies reflected in the lake and its waters. It's exactly like what was done in the case of causal bodies. What he's saying here is, you can take all the subtle bodies as individual, like the trees in a forest, many trees. Or you can take them all together as one forest. You can take all the subtle bodies together as one subtle body or one cosmic mind. Um, he gives the example of forest and trees, lake and water. And he says, the consciousness associated with the um, cosmic mind and the consciousness associated with each of these individual minds here is one and the same. It's like the sky reflected in the lake. The sky reflected in the drops of water and the sky reflected in the lake itself is the same sky. 
the sky enclosed by the total forest and the totality of the sky enclosed by the trees is the same sky. So in like that, the same consciousness is uh, limited by individual minds, seems to be different in every being, together with the entire cosmic mind seems to be one. But it is the same one consciousness only. There are no parts in consciousness. Therefore, we come to the end of this section. Evam Sukshma Sharira Utpatti, 97. Thus, two subtle bodies originate. All right. Big part of our job done. Remember what stage we have completed in the construction of the universe. Brahman with Maya, causal universe. Then subtle bodies, all these subtle elements, subtle bodies and all, subtle universe. And now gross elements and gross bodies and, and the universe, planets and stars and all, all of that is going to come next. All right, let's look at the activity in the chat. Lisa is saying, Swamiji, many of us reeling with everything that's happening in our country now. As Vedantins, what is the best way for us to handle this? What is the perspective we should take? Well, don't reel. Be, be, be calm and collected and uh, do whatever has to be done, whatever your role is in life is and as citizens of the country. There is no need to be uh, upset. We have seen worse uh, in this life or past lives and in other forms, in other countries, and you know, people are seeing worse than this, whatever you can imagine here in the United States. Yeah, but I know what you mean. I, I, I was watching the news on YouTube. Anuradha is asking, why is it that in, said in, that in higher Vedanta, Maya word should be changed to Ajnanam? What is the benefit? Um, I don't know if it said that, but notice that in the Vedanta Sara it is used. Vajjanam as totality of Ajnanam as individual Ajnanam. The whole point is to ign uh, overcome ignorance with the help of knowledge. I think to stress that. Because the Maya word is ambiguous. It covers so many things. Just now I saw a book which I had not seen earlier. Um, six meanings of Maya other than illusion according to Dr. Radhakrishnan. That's the name of the book. So... <laughs> Maya word has many meanings. Again, I'm very clear. Ignorance. Then Abhijit is asking, pronounce Maharaj, is there part of the causal body shared by all the subtle bodies? All subtle bodies have a causal body. Uh, and the causal body is uh, just ignorance itself. Think about it this way. When the mind is shut down, that is the causal body. When the mind is active, that is the subtle body. Um, it, it, uh, when, when is the mind shut down? Deep sleep. That is the causal state. Everything is in the seed state at that, uh, at that level. And then it becomes active in the waking state. Now, if you say, well, is it gone then in the waking state? Is the causal body gone? No, no, it's always there. There's a background to all um, uh, activity, all activity of the subtle body. Rama. How do we differentiate between Sukshma Bhuta or Tanmatra from Pancha Bhuta? So Bhuta means element. One must be clear here because in most Indian language, Bhuta means ghosts. And there is a reason why Bhuta means ghosts in Indian languages because the ghosts are made of subtle elements. This Sukshma, the five subtle elements we talked about, subtle space and air and fire and water and earth, that is the constituent of our minds. And what is a ghost? If I give up the body and I stay with the mind alone, I'm a ghost. It's, it's, a, it's consciousness with, with the mind only. I mean, with mind means with a subtle body, without the covering of a physical body. So you can't see me, but I can go around doing boo. And uh, so <laughs> that will be a ghost. And what am I made of then? What is the subtle body made of? Five subtle elements. Pancha, Sukshma, Bhuta. So that's why we are known as Bhuta. Ghost is known as Bhuta. Um... Then, how do we differentiate between Sukshma Bhuta and Tanmatra from Pancha Bhuta? So, so the Tanmatras are also Pancha Bhuta. There are five Tanmatras. Pancha Sukshma Bhuta. Five subtle elements. And these are also known as the five Tanmatras. Tanmatra means that only. Space, that only. Uh, fire is only fire. Earth is only earth. What does it mean only earth? What else could it be? We'll see what else it will be, it will be now soon. It will all be mixed up to form um, the 
the gross elements. When they are mixed up to form the gross elements by which the physical universe will be constructed, then they are called Pancha Mahabhuta, the five gross elements or five physical elements. Patrick is asking the practice of distinguishing the subject from objects and merging everything back into subject. Two steps to not to related to supreme position. Yes, supreme position, de supreme position. Are there two separate techniques to realize the same thing? No, it's the same technique. Um, the two steps to the not to. First, you separate consciousness from everything else. And then that everything else is merged back into consciousness. So that's the, uh, the way to do, understand Advaita, non-duality. And this superimposition, de-superimposition is basically the formal way in which this is done. This, this thing is accomplished, the two steps. Rick is asking, could it be that the six schools of Indian philosophy are not originally conceived as competitors, but as teachings appropriate to different levels of consciousness or spiritual development? Yes. And no. If you ask an academic, you, they will say that they're all competitors. They all grew up in rivalry to each other. But I have actually heard it said by monks and at least one great pundit who has written only in Bengali, unfortunately, um, in, in the early 20th century, who talks about the harmony between the six schools of uh, philosophy, of orthodox philosophy, orthodox Hindu philosophy, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, uh, Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa or Vedanta. So they seem to be rivals. They seem to say different things. But if you notice, there is a progression. The Nyaya and Vaisheshika schools, the Vaisheshika schools and Nyaya schools, they are pluralistic. There are multiple realities in this universe. And there are some minds who can't go beyond that, who want to be like that. That, it's, that seems to be realistic for them. To reduce everything to consciousness seems fictitious. So such minds, can they not progress spiritually? Certainly they can. Uh, and such minds are not dumb. William James, for example, he had running debates with Swami Vivekananda and later on with Swami Abhedananda. And he could not accept the monistic uh, doctrine, the Advaitic doctrine. There's a, there's a nice description of Swami Abhedananda who was visiting uh, New England at that time, I think. So he, was, uh, he gave a talk on Advaita. William James attends it with his students. And uh, then William James, in fact, in the, during the talk, William James was whispering questions to his students to ask to the Swami. And, the, uh, and those, these things were very formal. The president of the meeting stood up and said, the Swami would very much appreciate it if the professor, if the learned professor would put his own questions in person. Um, and William James laughed and he said, it's not appropriate now, but then he invited the Swami for dinner. He already knew Swami Vivekananda. So he knew that Abhidananda was a uh, brother disciple of Vivekananda. The, the, the dinner party at uh, uh, William James's house is desc described very nicely. There is Charles Landman, who was the founder of the Sanskrit um, department in Harvard University. There was um, 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 Royce, uh, one of the leading uh, American uh, um, idealistic philosophers. And uh, um, there was Swami Abhedananda and they, Josiah Rice, Josiah Rice. And there was William, William James. And Swami Abhedananda and James debated. On one side was Swami Abhedananda, uh, Charles Landman and Josiah Rice. All of them were for Advaita. And William James was on the other side. And the description we have got in our books is that uh, it, the discussion went on for three hours after dinner. Uh, and uh, then William James was forced to admit the force of the Swami's arguments and it ends there. But I don't think he was convinced because to, to the end of his days, he remained a committed uh, pluralist. So Nyaya and Vaisheshika philosophies are pluralistic. That there are ultimately many external realities. Substance is a reality. Quality is a reality. Action is a reality. So, and among substances, there's a kind of substance called self. And among selves, there are individual selves and the supreme self, which is God. And thus, religion is based on this distinction. One step higher is the Sankhya Yoga paradigm, where all material entities, instead of plural realities, they're all put under nature, Prakriti. So entire material universe is Prakriti, nature. 
as opposed to this is consciousness, which is seen as separate. Uh, it is not part of material nature. So it is somewhat similar to what William James is now proposing, not William James, uh, David Chalmers is proposing a panpsychism. In the latest form, panpsychism is an old theory, but the newest form of panpsychism, that consciousness is a fundamental reality, uh, all pervading reality um, in this universe. So there's a material universe and consciousness, very similar to what Sankhya said. What happens is then you see yourself as consciousness. And yet there are people who cannot dismiss this world as, a, as a, not real. So the world, the reality of the world is preserved. That is the Sankhya Yoga paradigm. Then you go to the Vedic uh, paradigm where it's divided into conventional religion, which is the realm of Purva, Purva Mimamsa, ritualistic conventional religion. And then you come to Advaita Vedanta. I'm moving by leap, leaps and bounds. Advaita Vedanta, which says uh, there is only one reality, Brahman. So you see, there's a certain progression. They are not really uh, rivals in that sense. They are, they are sort of harmonious. I was reading a uh, talk given by a leading Lama. He was the master of Dzogchen Buddhism in the last century. In fact, this Lama, uh, Urgan Tulku, I think, he lived in Nepal. Sam Harris mentions this Lama. And he says in his book, Waking Up, he says, I went there to learn the essence of Tibetan Buddhism. And he says, this is an extraordinary teacher who just seemed to hand uh, you the insight that you are not the body and mind, that you are um, the witness consciousness, they give you the power to overcome at least the tides, he, this is his words, tides of mental suffering. Um, directly you can overcome. And he shows that it's possible. So that Lama, I was reading one of his talks and translated into English. So there he says about Buddhism, he's not at all talking about the six schools. He's saying, after all, the schools of um, the, the, the lesser vehicle, the greater vehicle, and so on. You know, in, in Buddhism, they have the Theravada, the Mahayana, and the Tibetan Buddhists consider themselves to be su the superior. <laughs> so Professor Garfield said, Buddhism for dummies and Buddhism for se semi-dummies and Buddhism for smart people. <laughs> so that's how they regard themselves. So Buddhism for dummies is Theravada. Buddhism for se semi-dummies is Mahayana. And uh, in Mahayana itself, the really smart ones, you go to Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but he says in this writing, the various vehicles and the four schools of Buddhist philosophy, Sautrantika, Vaibhashika, the mind-only Yogachara school and the emptiness school of Madhyamaka, they are all pointing towards the same truth and they are designed to help people at different levels of preparation. Although if you read Buddhist philosophy, they are seen as terrible rivals. They are fighting mostly each other. Um, so I remember in Professor Garfield's class at Harvard last year, we were trying to identify which schools is this particular medieval Tibetan scholar, Tibetan Buddhist scholar. He's uh, harshly attacking certain schools of thought. And I identified those schools as the Purva Mimamsa, the Sankhya school. I thought he was attacking Hindu schools. And Professor Garfield said, absolutely not. They are almost not at all interested in the Hindu schools. All their targets of attack are the other Buddhist schools, whom they consider to be rivals. And here is this Lama saying they're not at all rivals. They're all designed for uh, a progression of thought. Then why do they attack each other? The reason is very simple. So if a particular school suits me, suppose I, the Nyaya school suits me, I really like it. Now it will not help me to know that it is actually for dummies. I must know that it is right and it's better than everything else. I should be able to use Nyaya to cut down your Advaita or your Tibetan Buddhism, everything, and show that Nyaya is really correct. Then only it helps me to progress in spiritual life. So they treated each other as rivals. Anyway, it's a very interesting uh, um, way of looking at it. Perhaps over time, the common understanding degenerated into seeing them as competitors. Yes, rather than as complementary tools. Correct. And in fact, now we can use them as complementary tools. I study and teach Advaita Vedanta, but I must admit, when I study Vishishta Advaita Vedanta or Dvaita Vedanta, the insights I get into bhakti is some, simply not available in Advaita Vedanta. Because it's not supposed to be. But if you are interested in bhakti, 
you should look at how Ramanuja interprets the Gita shlokas, overflowing with devotion. Um, the cosmic knowledge, desire, and doing are they to be understood as laws of physics? How can cosmic desire do worship? Uh, laws of physics, I don't know. They talk about a rita, uh, a law according to which the whole universe flows, and uh, and the laws of physics could be uh, a, a subset of that, I suppose. But this is a very subjective way of looking at it. So, cosmic desire would simply what we would call this uh, the will of God. But in dualistic religion, is called the will of God. Girish is asking, the phenomenal world is caused by Ishwara, right? Presumably using projecting power of Maya, right? But Ishwara is, itself is Brahman, limited by the projecting power of Maya, correct? So why have the intermediate step of Ishwara? Why not Brahman directly using the projecting power of Maya to create the illusion of the world? It is for our understanding. So there's this absolute reality, which is the only reality. We need not speak of Maya and the world, but we have, and, so, and that is Brahman. So that is the Nirguna Brahman or existence consciousness place. And Advaita says that is the reality, full stop. So what you're asking is, why not stop there? You cannot, because we, from our perspective, we have this entire universe, we demands an explanation. And we are these individual spiritual seekers. We demand a path to enlightenment. So all these um, answers we, have, we need. So we introduce Maya. Then what happens to that ultimate reality, Brahman? It becomes conditioned by Maya. Just like this crystal now appears to be yellow. So why don't you say that, talk about the crystal, why are you talking about yellow crystal? Because it is only when you talk about crystal conditioned by yellow, you can talk about yellow crystal, Brahman conditioned by Maya, you can talk about the projection of the universe. That Brahman conditioned by Maya, which creates, preserves and destroys the universe, which has the powers of you know, um, knowing, doing, willing, which has the powers of loving, protecting uh, what you think God has. Uh, so that is so distinct a category apart from Brahman, though, though it's physically not apart from Brahman. It's not anything distinct from Brahman. Nothing is distinct from Brahman. But for our understanding, it's so extraordinarily new. You have to give it a term. You have to call it something like Brahman. Otherwise, if you don't call that Brahman, um, if, if you call that Brahman also, don't use the term Ishvara, you have to say then directly, I am also a Brahman and all the world is Brahman, which is what Advaita is pushing you towards, but that's not uh, helpful straight away. Uh, all these categories are introduced. Ishvara is none other than Brahman, as you are none other than Brahman. And everything that we experience in the world is none other than Brahman. But first, because we experience this diversity, we have to label this diversity in order to handle this, uh, at least in concepts. If you say, why not Brahman directly using the projecting power of Maya to create the illusion of the world? That's exactly what is called God. Brahman using the power of Maya to uh, create the uh, illusion of the world or create the world um, is called Ishvara. That, that's called Ishvara. Why introduce a new term? Why don't you just say Brahman did it? Because Brahman didn't do it. That's the thing, you know. Uh, because at the level of Brahman, no Maya, no illusion, no world. The moment you introduce world and Maya and individual beings, then you better give a new name to Brahman, Ishwara or God. Rick says, do clusters of subtle bodies such as everyone in the city only form a collective subtle body that is their own integrity, the way clusters of cells in a body form different organs? Who knows? I haven't heard of this, but who knows? <laughs> And we really have to think about these things as we move into the era of artificial intelligence and so on. Deepa is asking, when we die, does the subtle body, Sukshma Sharira, retain the knowledge gained through Shravanam and Mananam, the chance that we do again? And so can we continue the spiritual life in next? Oh, right, an important question. So the subtle body, which includes memory, so does it include the memory? The, so the, if this is moving on to the Next life, will the memories be retained? Very important. Or do we have to go through Vedanta Sara class all over again? Next life. Unfortunately, you have to go through Vedanta Sara class all over again. All that is transmitted is the set of tendencies. 
at the time of death, the subtle, the subtle body curls up into its uh, causal body, retains certain tendencies from this life and goes on. So if you're a musician, you will love, um, you'll be an expert musician in your next life possibly. You love music, you'll show an extraordinary talent for music, but you will still need training. You'll pick up faster than everybody else. You will be a genius, you will still need training. If I have gone through this class, Vedanta Sara, and next, next life, I again end up in this class somehow or the other. I hope you don't. I hope you all get enlightenment. But if you do end up, you will understand things just like that. It will seem familiar and it will seem just obvious. I remember asking one of, our, of the, the abbot of our monastery about Swami Ranganathanandaji, who was at that time the vice president of the order how we had heard how as a brahmachari, as a novice in the 1930s and so on, this Swami, um, he, while washing the dishes in the monastery, there was a pandit teaching the Swamis there, a scholar teaching Vedanta, and he was regarded as too immature or not qualified enough to attend those classes, and he was given the duty of Swami Ranganathan, he was given the duty of washing dishes. He would wash the dishes and learn the verses just by listening to the class going on. How uh, he would, you know, he had no money to buy books, he use a pencil and a notebook to copy down entire texts. Uh, we have seen those notebooks, some of them are still there. I said, how is that possible? Uh, I, after a hard day's work in the monastery at night, let, let alone read Vedanta Sar or memorize the Gita, I, I, I just barely can read Reader's Digest. And then the, uh, the abbot said, oh, but they are not monks of one life. This is not the first life there that uh, he, he's a monk. He's been a monk in other lives. In Bengali, he said, And Vijay Babu is asking, So the answer is that, yes, we will not remember the particular verses or you won't have the same notebooks and things like that, but um, the, you will have the capacities. That's the essential thing. Even memories do not last throughout one lifetime. We may learn something now and then forget 20 years later. How much, we have, how much do we retain of what we studied in school anyway? Shaban is asking, can we get the name of the book that harmonizes the schools of philosophy? Yes, I have a Bengali photocopy of that book. It's very rare. Um, it's by Yogendranath Bhakti. Um, I'll see if I can find it. Samrat to everyone. God is the same as Hiranyagarbha? Yes and no. What is Hiranyagarbha? Consciousness limited by the causal body, further limited by cosmic mind. It's like you, Samrat, you have a certain existence in deep sleep, which is consciousness limited by one individual ignorance. Then you, you Samrat alone, you have a certain existence in dream, which is consciousness limited by one individual ignorance and one dreaming mind. And you, the same Samrat, same consciousness, have a limited existence as what you are right now, as Samrat, as one, as the same consciousness limited by same ignorant, uh, causal body, same subtle body, and this physical body, gross body. So just as you are the same as, as the dreaming Samrat, similarly God is the same as Hiranyagarbha also, God or Saguna Brahman. Shravani, how does Hiranyagarbha correlate with Ishwara, cosmic causal state? Cosmic mind or being in any way represent the mind of Ishwara? Absolutely. Just as you have a causal state, and a mind and a body. Altogether, you are called Shravani right now. So that is Shravani's body, Shravani's mind, and Shravani's causal uh, state. Causal, I keep saying causal state is no equivalent India, uh, English word. It's our deep sleep state, actually. So you, you have a deep sleep state, you have a dream state, and you have a waking state, which is what you are right now. And they all belong to you. Similarly, to Saguna Brahman alone belongs the deep sleep state, of, um, which is Saguna Brahman itself. Like when the universe is dissolved, God alone, alone exists without, with only Maya and nothing else. And then to Saguna Brahman alone belongs the cosmic mind. 
at which level the same reality will be called hiranyagarbha and then the physical universe will come not yet come it's going to come next then the whole cosmic being will be called virat or vishwarupa it that's what arjuna saw in the, the 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita the vishwarupa darshan is the view of the cosmic body of god and the cosmic body of god the same god with the entire universe as the body you might say but we are also seeing the entire universe so are we seeing the body of god yes but we don't recognize it as such we see it in fractions one of the commentators uh, says that what arjuna saw is exactly what we are seeing but we are seeing it scattered in bits and pieces across lifetimes we are experiencing a little by little by little by little different places people times objects experiences imagine all living beings together and uh, past present and future with all their bodies and all their minds and all of them suddenly you see the unite united into one super being you know the cosmic being and then that being turns around and looks at you no wonder <laughs> arjuna says his first reaction was he was scared out of his wits he says every hair in my body is standing on its end it's like if you look into those eyes it's like he says 10000 suns rising in the sky imagine the the power the intelligence the the awareness in those eyes of um, billions and billions of living beings throughout history all together united in one time and space and then i'm saying hello to you <laughs> you know and so he's, uh, he says krishna says this is what you wanted to see and arjuna was so ter- his reaction was only of terror he was so overwhelmed and he said i don't want to see this anymore i'm uh, like so that is that is the virat physical form of of god same god virat hiranyagarbha ishwara you know gross subtle and causal all right uh who's raised their hands uh good evening swamiji uh wanted to ask a question uh, like um, to verify if my um, thinking is correct uh so if let's say my is a set of uh, laws that govern the apparent reality and uh and the also mentioned earlier that uh like to have a desire is a, already a limitation so within this my and within this set of laws uh what is a primary um uh, motivator or a primary desire is it the desire to be happy and the only way to be happy is actually to realize that you're brahman and over the multitude of lifetimes this set of laws are governing your journey back to brahman and essentially yes. that's how machine functions right and the primary motivator the primary imperative is this seeking for fulfillment you may not use the word happy um, i remember this um, scientist sean carroll who wrote the uh, book the big picture he's from uh, uh he's from uh, from caltech big picture at the end he says that you know people say that happiness is the goal of life i don't think so that's too superficial uh, for me knowing the cause of the universe and the solution to the great questions of physics that is the goal of life and that's not a good way of looking at it because the simple question then you could ask sean carroll would be uh, does knowing the Um, you know the answers to the great questions of physics does that make you happy or unhappy obviously it makes you happy it fulfills you at some level that's why you are trying to get do that so the drive for fulfillment the drive for completeness the, in the upanishadic terms the drive for infinitude yo vai bhuma tat sukham na alpe sukham asti chandogya upanishad says that which is the vast bhuma means vast that which is the vast the limitless the infinite that alone is happiness there is so no happiness in the limited so therefore the moment the five elements exist it begins yes the moment ignorance exists begins why even the enlightened being in the midst of this drama of five elements sees the limitlessness everywhere and is absolutely not um, unhappy at all um, you know is completely fulfilled and does not find himself limited he sees i am the limitless um, you know existence consciousness bliss it's not that the ocean has to be waveless to be perfect it's the same water 
even if there are tens of thousands of aids coming and going it's that underlying one water essence that has to be realized to notice the limitlessness of water in the ocean similarly the underlying one awareness existence place that once that is realized let the five elements remain let the five elements combine to make the gross elements let them combine to make planets and stars the enlightened being person is fully happy as if only brahman exists for him only brahman exists actually but this state of happiness it's still a state it's still an experience in the mind right yes. but okay so the state of happiness in the mind is a state uh-huh. and the fulfillment we are talking about is actually not a state this state of happiness is a good indicator it is what drives us towards that fulfillment that fulfillment we are talking about is brahman itself it's not a state of mind but it the thing is when i say that people are disappointed so when i realize brahman won't i be happy won't i have a happy state of mind if the mind is still there yes you will once you realize your infinite nature which is happiness itself then the mind which belongs to this enlightened being uh, will always be flooded with happiness and there will be this underlying current of fulfillment everywhere the gita says attaining which nothing greater remains to be attained uh, established in which the deepest of sorrows cannot shake you um so nothing greater remains to be ha- attained at the level of the mind who wants to attain great things the mind does no sorrow can shake you where is the where are these sorrows at the level of the mind and those sorrows cannot cannot shake what cannot shake the mind so what i'm talking about this fulfillment this infinitude limitlessness this is brahman itself it's not a state of the mind but the state of mind of the enlightened being reflects this Uh, who else has raised a hand? Thank you. Uh, Pranam Maharaj, I, you, I, I just want to make a comment, I mean, about your answer to Girish's question about the God, need God to explain what the universe considers us. I, and I was thinking that the same thing is ap- applicable to reflected consciousness also. There is no really any reflected consciousness, but we need that to explain what's going on. I mean, how... The sen- no once you admit something is going on then you have to admit reflected consciousness you have to admi- admit if you admit a world if you admit a body if you admit a mind and in the mind there is consciousness don't you feel awareness in the mind right now what is that awareness that you feel in the mind right now but you are right what you are pointing towards is all this reflected consciousness and stuff is nothing other than the original consciousness the pure consciousness atman itself the witness consciousness so you are always the witness consciousness that's true and that's an important thing to hold on to in all these distinctions one tends to get lost um the thing one must hold on to is that brahman alone exists that pure consciousness alone is there that unlimited existence consciousness bliss and that always is there all the time um that lama was reading he says the buddha nature underlies samsara and nirvana what we call nirvana what we call samsara they are appearances in the buddha nature the buddha nature is the only thing that exists even when a person is trapped in samsara or is trying to say oh i'm trying to go from being a trapped being uh, in sorrow to attain my buddha nature he says no no the buddha nature is there right now that buddha nature alone is manifesting as samsara and as this trapped being and then when you after a lot of spiritual practices when you attain nirvana that buddha nature itself is manifesting as nirvana it is the same. it's a better manifestation maybe it's the same buddha nature everywhere same brahman everywhere yes anuradhi a uh, continuing to dimitri's uh, question when a person is enlightened do they have to be jivan mukta have to be in the sense like when you are saying that okay they will be always happy they will see brahman in everything but they still have their feelings yes. they have emotions still playing yes so for the time being you might lose the sight of brahman and Correct. then Absolutely. come back again yes and that's the jivan mukta <clears throat> and that jivan mukta never really loses sight of brahman it's just that in the play of life you cannot be a static smiley face you know always always with a big a scary grin on your face if you look at the lives of enlightened beings if you look at ramana maharshi or vivekananda or something 
Ramana Maharshi would generally place it and serene throughout. Vivekananda sometimes scolds and he laughs and he jokes and he feels, he deeply, deeply feels the sorrow of other people uh, around him. But notice certain things. He is always able to withdraw into his real nature, into, into a serenity, which is he never loses. And the second thing is his, his sorrow and weeping are always for the sake of others. At no point ever does he feel sorry for himself. That is a Jeevan Mukta. A Jeevan Mukta is somebody who has solved his or her problems. Really, permanently, completely. So is solved. it synonymous? With? A Jeevan Mukta and enlightenment? Jeevan Mukta and enlightenment? No. <clears throat> enlightenment is Brahma Jnana. That's so, what I was uh, getting at. Enlightenment yeah. is Brahma Jnana. And the result will be Jeevan Mukta as long as the body and mind last. Body and mind will last only because Prarabdha Karma is there. This is from our perspective, perspective of others. And that's good for us. That's, that enables an enlightened being to dwell amidst us and teach us. If enlightenment meant that after enlightenment, there'll be no body and mind, it would be equivalent to suicide. You would have to call 911 every time anybody <coughs> attained enlightenment. They're dead because they attained enlightenment. No. Uh, the body and mind continue exactly as they were continuing. So a person and, can be Brahma Gyani, but not Jivan Mukta. Ah, that is another question. Um, first, let me deal with this. So a person is Jivan Mukta, as long as the body mind lasts, enlightened person. When the body mind, when the body dies, uh, instead of going on to other bodies, like all the subtle bodies do, the subtle body of an enlightened person goes back to nature. Now we understand what that means. Physical body always goes back to the five gross elements. Now for the enlightened person, the subtle body will also go back to the five subtle elements out of which they have been made. That normally does not happen. Our subtle bodies are sticky. They go on, they exist together, and they go on from lifetime to lifetime until realization comes. After realization comes, nature is done with you. This person has seen through my games, so you stop playing now. I'm not going to let, <laughs> let you play anymore. Your physical body falls apart at the death, and the subtle body also goes back into nature. And there is nothing to go forward into. Uh, again, in Buddhist terms, definition of nirvana. The simplest definition of nirvana they have is exactly this. The cessation of the five aggregates. They talk not about what body, mind, the five panchaskanda, that stops and then just stops. You remain as Brahman, they won't say that. They don't use that language. It just stops, Extinct, extinct extinguishes this. So nothing remains. No, we didn't say that. But what remains, we will not say. That's the Buddhist approach. Now your further question, does enlightenment, Brahma Jnana mean necessarily that you will become a Jivan Mukta? No. Here is a further discussion you find in the Jivan Mukti Viveka. Who is a Jivan Mukta? You might say perfectly enlightened. So is there a, some, some kind of partial enlightenment possible? Yes, it is possible. And the Jivan Mukti Viveka says, three things are necessary for perfect enlightenment or Jivan Mukti to become an enlightened being, fully enlightened being. One is um, enlightenment itself. What is enlightenment itself? Tattva Jnana, knowledge of reality, realization of the reality. I am Brahman, realization. Isn't that all that is necessary? No. <clears throat> Second, he says, Manonasha. Literally, it means destruction of the mind, but it means Samadhi. The ability to be, con I'll put it very precisely, the ability to center your mind completely in your realization. So wouldn't that not naturally happen? It would naturally happen at the moment of your realization. But if the mind is not fully trained and not fully prepared, it will again start running around. But the realization will be there. Then the third thing necessary for full enlightenment is called, um, uh, is called Vasanakshaya. Vasanakshaya is the perfection of Chitta Shuddhi. Chitta Shuddhi, purification of the mind. Purification of mind to an extreme point where there's absolutely no desires, extinguished all desires. So all desires extinguished, the mind stilled in reality, and you know the reality, I am Brahman. This is a Jivan Mukta. What, practically, what difference does it mean? Practically, the Jivan Mukta can effortlessly manifest all the qualities you would 
associate with a saint you know complete fearlessness total unselfishness being impervious to uh, worldly suffering i can at just at at at, at a you know so easily withdraw the mind from physical suffering of the body and so on and so forth right so uh, that is the nature of the jivan mukta now vidyarnya says sometimes it is possible either by the grace of the guru or by your past lives practices or whatever uh, you might make a breakthrough and realize that you are brahman but if your vasanakshaya is not perfected yet if your manonasha is not perfected yet what will happen he says two things will happen one is this person is already enlightened what what is the benefit of that at the point of death that is the end of this person's game of life will never come back again but until that point he says if you want to enjoy the benefit of enlightenment be live in this life with full of bliss and then go ahead and perfect your vasanakshaya and manonasha so the intense spiritual practice is necessary for that after enlightenment uh, to be steady in that and that you see in the lives of many great spiritual aspirants ramana maharshi months and months he remained after the initial breakthrough he remained months and months and absolutely immobile right, under very austere conditions sri ramakrishna nirvikalpa samadhi and then 6 months in that state the direct disciples of sri ramakrishna in the, all their lives the monastics you know all in the lives you will see after the passing of sri ramakrishna after having extraordinary mystic experiences they plunge into even deeper and very hard spiritual practice and they were asked what are you trying to do because there were other disciples of sri ramakrishna who did not do that they said we have already been given a glimpse of god we know it's real this world is an appearance and so what else are you doing what else you're trying to do he gave us everything and these monks they said that what he gave us we are trying to make it our own uh, in technical terms they are centering themselves in that truth and they are disciplining their bodies and minds so that they become a perfect vehicle for the expression of their realization which they already have let me see more comments are coming in vasanakshaya uh varma gyana need not automatically Im- imply vasana shunyata uh, no it need not automatically but remember uh, already the vasanas the desires have been uh, thinned out they were called tanukrita they say has been attenuated to a great degree it's not that a person who is very greedy or uh, uh, you know sensual or uh, uh, angry uh, jealous um, will suddenly get enlightenment that's not possible already a great deal of purification of the mind has taken place all right then we did not start the construction of the physical universe but that's a big job we will uh, we are ready now next time we will start the construction of the physical universe om shanti 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 hari om tat sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu